applications here, right? Aversion therapy. What's that classical aversion therapy thing that they do with cigarettes, right? It's been in every TV show and all sorts of, you know, books and magazines and all that stuff. And what do they do? They make you smoke a bunch of cigarettes all at once and get you sicker than a dog, right? That's aversion therapy. That's classical conditioning. You know, the idea is that the cigarette, if it makes you sick, then the cigarette, you're going to want to avoid the cigarettes in the future, right? Um, it's, it's called condition suppression, um, and it works really well for a while. In other words, it's not necessarily permanent. Uh, but it does have some, it, it is useful, at least at first. Think about alcohol. Right? There's an entire treatment uh, field around aversion therapy and alcohol. In fact, there's even research under drugs that allow this to happen. And it's called antabuse, right? You take the antabuse, right? and then if you have any alcohol while, you're on, while, while you've got antabuse in your system, you're going to get sick. It's just a given because of what antabuse does and how it bro blocks the breakdown of the alcohol in your body and blah, blah, blah all this stuff. So the idea is that we're making alcohol a bad thing. Right? There's all sorts of scenarios about how aversion therapy and uh, using antabuse to, use, uh, to treat alcoholism is problematic. But one of those things is it's very stimulus specific. So if I'm a beer drinker, right, I may be able to use some aversion therapy and get me to stop drinking beer, but that's not going to stop me from going over and getting me a bottle of vodka. Right? So in fact, I probably wouldn't get sick in the presence of the vodka. Chemotherapy is a classic uh, situation here. Right? We've already, I've already kind of hinted at this in the past, but the idea is that, again, it's, it's a type of aversion, right? So chemotherapy is a poison. It's going to make you sick. So it's a U.S. So anything you pair with that in the future is probably going to make you sick. So in other words, avoid your favorite foods when you're getting chemotherapy because those favorite foods will be paired with sickness. Well, guess what? In the future, you might not; those might not be your favorite foods. Uh, so that, that's one of the things that happens with chemo. So in fact, most doctors will give you that warning. They'll say, before you come in for chemo, don't eat that. You're like, you're, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I got a chemo treatment tonight, so I'm gonna have a bunch of pasta this afternoon. And I just love pasta, it's gonna make me feel better. And yeah, it might. And up until the point you have the chemo, and then the next time you cook that pasta, <laughs> And then you're like, oh, I, that just, oh, 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 it's going to make sick, right? So uh, so that's something that you want to worry about. So, uh, But uh, that's something to avoid, at least if you know somebody getting chemo um, you, and they haven't been told that, it might be a good thing to, to remind them of. <laughs> yes, that's what it says. Right? Uh, your book covers a great example, but the idea is how do you become regular without the use of a medication all the time, right? And maybe you've got some medical issues or maybe you're just having troubles with it. Maybe your diet doesn't let you be regular. Well, you can use classical conditioning um, to produce a sort of regular response when it comes to defecating, right? Um, and the book goes, through, like I said, the book goes through, it seems a little humorous, but it's true. You know, you take a laxative and then you pair it with something else. Um, I think the example in your book is a mild shock, right? So then you, eventually that mild shock will yield the conditioned response of uh, defecating. So you can get yourself on a schedule and then you can fade out that US of the, uh, the laxative. And it works. It's been effective. I know there's one example in the book, but there's many examples out there if you dig into the literature. Okay. Nocturnal enuresis. Right? So for those of you that don't know, it's bedwetting. Right? So what do bedwetting pads do? Okay. They make a noise. Right? They do all sorts of stuff. Okay? There's also They protect the bed, blah, blah, blah. But one of the things that they do are they make a noise. Okay? The idea is you learn to detect, the stim or you learn to detect that stimulus. So if you pee, then the sound goes off. The sound is a conditioned stimulus, and you learn to de um, you learn to detect that, okay? um, or you hear that and it wakes you up, and that type of thing. Right? So that condition. So what you learn to detect. Okay, so I'm sorry. Let me try this example again. I got a little confused with my slide there for a second. So again, the bedwetting pad. If you urinate, it's going to make a sound. It's going to make a little buzz or something like that. You can detect that. Um, that buzz will wake you up. So that buzz is an unconditional stimulus for getting up. But what, it, what you're trying to do is pair that buzz with that feeling that you have inside of you of having to go to the bathroom. So ultimately what you want is that feeling to wake you up. So if we've got the bedwetting pad on, then it's going to go, 
but you're going to get that feeling before then. Now, you're not even awake and this stuff is working. And it works like a charm, by the way. Uh, then the idea is that you'll detect that feeling inside of you that it's time to go to the bathroom. So you get up and you go to the bathroom and you then basically are reinforced. Right? So reinforcement is then going to sort of take over because you're avoiding the wetness, you're avoiding all that stuff. But you, the idea is that this is sort of a combination of classical conditioning and opera, which kind of hints at what the next chapter is about. But the, uh, but again, that classical conditioning here is learning to detect the feeling inside your body, that CS. And the US is uh, the noise that actually happens. This isn't a punisher. A lot of people think these are punishers. It's not. It's about developing a new response and about you being able to tell when that response happens. Um, and a lot of kids, believe it or not, don't know that feeling. And that's that feeling of I have to pee. They, they may be able to sense it a little bit, but it's not salient to them. It's not obvious. They're too excited. They're too doing their other stuff. Or they're too deep asleep and they just, they just pee. And that's, uh, it sounds kind of odd as I'm sitting here talking about it, but that's very normal. And that's one of the difficulties that uh, some children have with learning to go to the bathroom. And uh, a lot of people overthink it. They're like, oh, my kid just doesn't want to pee in the toilet. And it's like, no, it probably, you know, one of the first thoughts you should have if you're having trouble with potty training is, can they tell what the feeling of having to pee is like? And until you explicitly teach that, you can't be sure that there's something else going on. So that's one of those first, it, it's, it's a low hanging fruit, so to speak. It's not, okay, that was kind of bad, but the idea is it's an easy target. That's something that you should go for first if you're having trouble with kids that are learning how to pee, or even if they're, you know, bedwetting at night. Okay, so, all right, that's about it. There's a bunch more that we could go on and on and on about this. Time.